shoulder or something. You gotta, you gotta live around that. I talk to friends of mine on cops, firemen, or just re regular people I run into every day. They can't believe that there's clams coming out of these waters, and I'm trying to explain to them the clams they're eating are probably these clams. Raritan Bay produces 25% of New York shellfish. These are probably the best beds in the United States. There's billions of clams out there. The state has never spent five cents on this bay. It's all natural, natural seed. It seeds itself. For clams to reproduce and self-generate, it doesn't get any better than Staten Island. The sea turtles are awesome when they come up near the boat. I think they're attracted to the sound. How big are they? Um, maybe three feet by three feet. They're nothing tremendous. That's big, though. Oh, yeah, they're big. Well, this week, I fished every day. Right now, I'm not working. I'm a printer, and I work a good half a year a year. That's it. This is working away, you know? It's not all funny games up here. Like I said, I fish every day, you know? You gotta get in condition, believe it or not. You're moving your arms all day up here. It's not easy. I like this bridge because it's a nice place to spend the summer. There's some on the beach, yeah, I can see yeah. it. You know, yeah. The whole mess in there is loaded with them. I see tails sticking up. They're up there. Horseshoe crabs come up on the first and second moon in June to mate on the beach and spawn in the shallow water. And little by little, they filter out of the inlets and go back into the ocean. We harvest the horseshoe crabs in June so that we're able to have bait for our hilly fish traps. And we have them for our full run of the American eel for the people that like to have them at Christmas, which is mainly the Italian people. Two little feet here. That's what he feeds himself with. He'll eat that clam eventually. Every time the clam relaxes a little bit, they go in deeper and deeper till they get in it. The horseshoe crab dates back in the fossil records about 200 to 300 million years. This crab is it's a true city creature. Just as New Yorkers are able to survive in this harsh environment with a lot of stresses. The horseshoe crab has survived basically unchanged and can coexist living in a huge urban center like New York City. A lot of things that depend on those horseshoe crab eggs, you know, like all of the birds, you know, even ourselves, you know, when you think about it. They really support a lot of wildlife. Weekends, I go in back of Kennedy Airport. There's a couple of channels out there. I do some fishing over there. Sometimes there's some really, really big blues and stripers out there. Most people don't go because they think it's polluted, so it, you know, it helps It helps uh, the people uh, that do fish. I had a great time with snappers this year. Every cast, a snapper. Nice size, too. And I just certain spots, certain spots that I don't want to reveal. I've seen some monster fish. I've seen 50-inch stripers up there. I've seen... You know, 40 pounders. I mean, really, really big. Don't get the wrong idea. We don't want you to go fishing. You know what I mean? Because if you go fishing, that's it. Then you got to clean everything out. We won't be able to go fishing no more. You know what I mean? <laughs> Right now, we're in a marsh that's surrounded by a highway on one side, uh, train tracks on the other, a golf course behind it, and uh, a lot of homes on this shore. It's kind of a, a miraculous little pocket of uh, a little re relic or remnant of what was. So I consider it a little gem. You don't really want to say where we are? No, not, not by name. That's the beauty of striper fishing. You can find a few spots around the city where you can fish for a couple hours after work or before work or at night. And uh, you can have a couple hours of sport here and there and not really disrupt your life. I find it, I find it fits into my life very beautifully.
one of the finest baits you can use on our game fish. Yeah, the stripers, weak fish will take them. Blue fish certainly tear at them with a vengeance. That was done good, Joe. I expect this throw to be better than the others because I think we did that just right. Always at this change of light is the best time to get the bunkers. The change up of light seems to confuse them when you throw the net. On the other side of the channel, you'd see the parachute jump. We we're just off the beach. This way, he's allowed to swim. This hook holds him into the current pretty straight. And uh, when the bluefish come from behind, or they grab him, you have all the business on showing. Now you'll see that line. When there's bluefish around, those bunk, that rod will be dancing. And when that bunker sees the bluefish, it really, you go almost forecast when you're getting a hit. Down south, you got a lot more variety and you got a lot of glamour fish, but up here, you got quantity. What amazed me this year, we had a, a, a run of winter flounder that was the, 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 probably the best run on the seaboard. real go. That fish go about 12 pounds. There's a big apple blue. Nice fish. We're in fish heaven now. Okay. It's right there. Oh. The most prized inshore game fish in the Northeast. That's the keeper. Yep. And we've got our limit. Nice fish, Joe. Good morning. Thanks for joining us today. This is called the Harbor Survey Program. Today we're going to monitor water quality of the East River. We began in 1909 with about five stations. We now look at about 53 different stations throughout the water bodies surrounding New York City. Over the course of time, we can look at the data collected at these sites and we can begin to determine how good a job our treatment plants are doing of cleaning the, the, uh, the wastewater of the city. The waters here have improved tremendously. That's due to coming down very hard on the industry. It's also keeping raw sewage out of the waters. Much to my surprise and sometimes alarm, the people that live in this area seem to take these waterways for granted. They don't realize what a precious resource is right here. We're starting to see little baby groupers this year. It's the first year I've ever seen them. They're only about five inches long, but that's a fish that never really came up to these waters. I don't think these waters ever got warm enough or tropical enough for them, but that's a good sign. Last year, a guy caught a king mackerel. That's another fish that uses and more bonita than I've ever seen. It's always bonita around, and years ago, we never had no bonita here. Two springs ago, we had a lot of seals around, and they were doing a job on the flounders. We were actually seeing them come on up, laying on their backs with the flounders in their mouth, eating them, and then going back down for another one. The water is fantastic. In the last, what, 10 years, 12 years, we've seen this water one year turn almost green-blue, a two-tone color. We stood there freaked out. At night, you worked your lures on the rocks, and you could actually see the fish eight feet down. Years ago, you used to see shit on, on, on excuse the language, you used to see doo-doo on the water. Now you don't. People are saying the water's getting cleaner. Ah, that's baloney. They always take. They need to give up. When you lose the hope, you lose everything. And it's look like they don't thinking what it will be the future. Nobody thinks the future, just now.
Honey! Judy! That was our first date. Coney Island Pier. We used to sit and get bit by bugs and watch the rats and catch the stripers like crazy. He's been fishing, I should say, <laughs> from the day he was born. <laughs> Chicky! This is the little black pug. He was skinny when we got him, but we feed him good. He's really good. Come on, did you put extra ice on him or you never did? Oh, I didn't. Oh, that poor fish. He's a fish. Oh, Philip. I can't show them the fish. It's in the oh, bag. I'm going to go down and get the paper. One second, I'll be right up. Philip, come on, Philip. It's terrible. Look at the size of this fish. I can't pick him up. What's too heavy? Come over here. He puts it in my bathtub. You should put it in his wife's bathtub. Philip. Here I am, Mom. Come and take the fish out of here so I can get out of the bathroom. This fish is definitely, you know, over the 30-inch mark. I would say from the snout to the fork of the tail, he's about 32 inches. In another four years, this fish would go into the 40-pound range if he would have missed my hook, you know. And I would have let him go, I'll be honest with you, because this fish is a little undersized for me to keep. But I kept him because of the look of death in him, you know. Okay, is it all right if we start to clean him? The bottom piece, I'll make it like a little fish. And you get a lot of meat in here. And if you filleted them, eh, you waste it. So from, let's say, about here down, I'll make that a fish portion. To, and then the rest will be steaks. Now, usually, I'll take this and put it right on an extremely red-hot barbecue. But uh, not tonight. We're going to let Judy uh, That's too big, do my stuff. That'll never cook on the barbecue. Philip, easy. Okay, Mom. We'll you should have down. cleaned the belly out first. Well, no, I didn't want to do that. Why? Well, because I just didn't. There, uh, we're going to have one tonight. Can I'm going to take one big one. My brother is out in Florida, and my sister in Staten Island, and they come and visit. But I got Mom. I'm the lucky one. You're right. Okay, take it with you. One minute. Come in, Throw them in there. Okay. I'll get you a new I know, I know. You don't like to use the towel. You don't have to tell me. Well, the dog fits into the family. Right? When they all three together, him, Judy, and the dog, they go. Ooh, watch it. Okay, if you could do me a favor and uh, reel in your lines on this side, we're going to do a quick boarding. I got it. Get up. That's all you got? Yes, sir. These are violations of almost $250 per fish. And if you have more, if you're, a, if you're an offender, a repeat offender, the judge can literally you know, sink you. You guys know what the size limit is for the blackfish? I think it's 11, right? Wrong. Huh? You gotta be at least 13 inches. Oh. 11 and a half. Please. People just don't give a shit, you know? They don't worry about what their kids are gonna catch a few years from now or their grandchildren. They just take everything they can take right now. I'm gonna give you a summons for the uh, blackfish. You'll have a court date. Just make sure you show up at court and we'll take care of it in court. And we'll give you a copy of the regulations before we leave. Ha! Here we go. This fish is probably be anywhere between 15 and a half and 16. Nice fish, but he probably is a short. A plenty of eat here, but I want to measure him. 16, right on the button. These uh, gentlemen had uh, two blackfish or tautog. That was short. They're supposed to be 13 inches or 11. And they have four porgies, which are legal size, 7 inches. Commercial fishing takes the fish away. I don't think that a man down here with a fishing pole and a hook is going to make that much of a dent in the bass population. One, nine, one more. If I catch a fish and it's undersized and somebody wants it, I'm going to give it to them. I'm not going to throw it back. 
this way too. A guy who comes up here once a month and needs a meal for himself and the family. So he takes a small fish or two. I mean, that's, that's a, but the guys that come up habitually all the time and always break the law, those are the guys I'm talking about. Oh, 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 what a beautiful. Kennedy Airport, the Twin Towers, little subway trains going that way, right? Put a hat, you see anybody? Just me, you, him, and old John. It's like a lost world out here. And what's it say on the bottom? U.S. government. Jamaican Bay Wildlife. Bay Wildlife Refuge. You know, like we used to be our own conservationists. We never, we never kept pound in an area. We'd work here today, and then we'd go down the other end of the bay and this and that. But now we can't. Now we're like on a on a reservation. They got a line drawn around, and they said, you, Larry, and Larry can stay in there, but don't come out of there. In other words, they just want to get rid of you and take some city person that likes on a Saturday or Sunday to come out and watch the birds, which he's entitled to. Let them. They can watch me when I come by and pull my pots, too. Because I'm a part of this bay, same as the ducks and the water and everything else. But don't take my living away so that he, that stockbroker can sit out here in the marsh and watch the ducks, but he don't want to see me. So who's to say next month, next week, next year, they don't take that buoy and plunk it out there for it and say, huh, now I don't want you over here either. Right now, I, I think most people that work on the water are an endangered species. It's sad to know that. 10 years from now that this may not even be an acceptable living in this area, like no one will be left. I tell people, commercial fishermen, that they're, they're, they're mystified. They don't even, they don't even think that even exists anymore. The pay isn't that great, but you get all the advantages of being a fisherman, being free, being able to be with my father. And I'm always with my father, you know, if we're, if we're working, we go hunting together, we go fishing together. It's a great thing in itself, you know, me and him have a you know, really tight bond and basically lost without each other. And I never came into this expecting to get rich. I, I always came into this with the you know, expectation that if I can pay my bills, in the future feed my family, and buy the things that, you know, have money left over to get a few things that I want, I'm a happy man. We were fishing by Ellis Island. It was in the end of May. This guy was from moving to Texas. He was spending his last night uh, in the area, and he wanted to spend it in New York Harbor while fishing. So anyway, you know, they were catching fish, and they wanted to take some pictures, and he wanted to back up. You know, just like in the cartoons, and you walk right to the back of the boat and basically spent his last night in New York Harbor. <laughs> I was at the Welcome Back to Brooklyn. I had a table down there two years ago. And people that lived in Brooklyn and Manhattan all their lives were coming over and asking me where Sheepshead Bay was. They didn't know we had a fleet of boats in Sheepshead Bay. Lived there all their lives. Never know it. Because the city doesn't do anything for us and our politicians do anything for us. Captry, everybody knows. Montauk, everybody knows. We're the largest fishing fleet on the East Coast and nobody knows we exist. I married my wife, she lived in Queens. She never even knew Sheepshead Bay existed until I married her. They had a fleet of party boats at Sheepshead Bay that was like a, like a mecca over there. And you'd have literally throngs of people coming down. They would sail early and uh, 
Many a day, you would see 500, 1,000 people standing on the dock in Sheepshead Bay because they got down late and they couldn't get on a boat anymore. All the boats sailed. That's a thing of the past. There's no such thing anymore as boats getting capacity crowds. You don't look like a mate, you look like a derelict. Yes. Each year it's a little bit less. Each year the business gets a little tougher and one or two boats will give it up and go out of business and you'll say, well, you hate to see them go, but that means there's going to be more people for me, but it doesn't work out that way. To make a living out of it, it's a pretty tough business. As far as my grandchildren is concerned, uh, I hope they get a good education and they prepare themselves for the outside world. Get yourselves ready. Well, let's hope we have a good day together. People will go to Alaska to go see the sights of Alaska and have people go look look at whales and all kinds of stuff like that. Here, fishing, as far as I'm concerned, is probably the cheapest one-day vacation a person could have, and you get a bonus. If you catch any fish, you get to keep them. That's a keeper. <laughs> It's a natural resource. Right the fucking boy, am I good? How many chances do you have to deal with Mother Nature and a natural resource right out your back door? It's a day's out activity, you're away from all the hustle, bustle. How long is it from your house? You're right in. And there's the New York Aquarium. You can go look at Coney Island right behind us. Here we are. Take a look around. Almost as far as you can see. Look at all this fish life. Once you get hooked on fishing, it's worse than drugs, I guess. <laughs> it's a natural eye. <laughs> you can never get enough. You gotta come up to here. We kiss him and say goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, wait. Well, bring your lines up. We are on our way home. I don't know if the people know. It's almost unbelievable that in New York City, God knows how many millions of people are involved, and that out of all those millions of people, so few of them uh, have a desire to go fishing. We live in the hope that uh, we think it's going to get better, and uh, but we live in hope and we die in despair. I'm coming with the bike. You know, I stay in the morning uh, till 10 o'clock, till 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, depending on how the, the weather. And then I'm going home and that's it. I'm a early bird. I needed to go out. I, I am an outside person, so that's the reason. So I'm coming for fresh air, I'm coming here, there, and spending the time. I worked in the industry, the textile industry. And in the weekend, I had to come when I didn't work on Saturday or even a day. I needed to come from Manhattan. When I, the, the wind touched me, the body, they relax. I, they re if I didn't get the election, to relax, then the whole week it was, I feel I missed something. Believe it or not, fishing is one of the cheapest recreations around. The guy told me yesterday, $65 a pop to go to Radio City for the Christmas show. How can you afford to take kids? You don't have gangs, thieves, you're not gonna get raped, mugged, or assaulted. And every hour on a boat, so now they're not hanging out on a street corner. And most people will help one another, you know, if there's any questions. Yeah, people are pretty friendly on boats. Yeah, they are. Yeah. There are 
nicer clientele no matter what ethnic group they are. The Orientals come up here, they come up here with 10 guys, 20 poles, and everything they catch, they keep. They don't measure anything. They make a few dinners out of a blackfish and they get $25 a freaking dinner in the city. So they make money with them. Russians are pretty good fishermen, I believe it or not, but they, they got no understanding of the law either. I live by Aqueduct Racetrack in Howard Beach. There's nothing but Indians all over there. That's Indians. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's even a bunch of Mexicans that come up here too. Hello, Mama Sa, I got some more sea robin for you today. You want some more sea robin? Oh. I say for you? Come on, hey, Papa Papa. Yeah, I got, I got sea robin. There's, there's three under there. You can take them all. Somebody makes use of them. They make use of them. I don't eat them. Thank you, Mama Sa. Okay. I guess the Russians are fishermen in their country. You know the Orientals are. They, they wiped out their seas already, you know? So, I don't know, I guess, just their cultures. They nah, this guy's going to make a movie. Make yeah, a movie in the bridge. Yeah, make a movie in the bridge. That's Freddie. Freddie's been fishing with us a few years. <laughs> These porky G's. I don't know, he don't, he don't speak to much English. They're unbelievable. You hook them, they jump, they twirl, they belly bump, they do everything in the book, and they run like hell. Mira, Mira. But they fight like sin. That's the best part. I love them. I love them. I go off on their fight. Nothing like this, man. For all those guys out there that spend all those millions of dollars for nothing, going upstate, going here and there, they should be aware of this. Freak their, freak their eyes on this stuff here. Something you can get in cold air, and all you got to do is pay car fare to get on the train. I already got my filet inside of a plastic bag. From sharks we caught earlier tonight. We got about 16 sharks over there. So I got a, a little variety of both. Now I got filet of shark in my bag. I got what I want to eat, and this I get rid of. You sell it? Yeah. How much? 15. I get it too, without no sweat when I hit my block. Who, who wants to go upstate to catch a fish this big? They don't even get them this big. When I first started fishing, striper was a really rare thing. You know, back in the mid-70s and things, you'd never see a striped bass. I mean, then all of a sudden, here they were. I'm just gonna tag him. And send him back on his way. Number 3270 here. Let's see if he gets anywhere. Great. <laughs> I had one return not too long ago where a fish that I tagged was caught again in the Chesapeake Bay um, about three or four years later. I gotta have my fresh fish to eat. I got two daughters and, and my wife. They all hate fish. I'm the only fish eater in the house. And I'm not gonna go, you know, a month without any kind of fresh fish. I freeze fish. I told you I sell it. I won't even eat it once I freeze it. It's gotta be fresh for me. What does your family think of the amount of time you spend fishing? I think I'm nuts. I, I like them. I eat them. I ate one. I ate one yesterday. I ate a nice blue one. You know, a lot of people, you know, they, they mistake this river for, you know, like a bloodbath. They think they throw people off, they kill somebody, and they do this, you know. There's good fishes here, you know. I mean, if, if I was to catch a, a, a 25 pounder, I'm not gonna throw it back in the lake. I'm gonna take it home, and I'm gonna eat it. I'm gonna clean it thoroughly, and it will be eaten. It will be consumed in my stomach. We conducted a study of pollutants that we know are in the Hudson River to see if anglers who eat fish from these waterways have elevated levels of these pollutants in their bodies. Generally, the guys had no trouble answering our questions. They're more than happy to talk about their fishing, how proud they are of what they catch, and how they share their catch with their friends and their families. Tonight at dinner. We interviewed anglers throughout the New York area. 90% of them were male, but the population at most risk are women of childbearing age and children. What we found was that those who most frequently ate fish from these waters had the highest levels of contaminants in their bodies. We don't know how that translates into adult health.